<laughs> Manna and Mercy, January 27th. We're in the last chapter of, of the book. Turn to page 76. The very last chapter. And it's both a summary chapter for the whole book, Manna and Mercy, the whole study. And it's using some of the, the texts and images and taking us through some of the visions of the book of Revelation. So the, how the Bible ends up in the book of Revelation is how Manna and Mercy uh, ends up. And it, uh, maybe that's not surprising that, that you know, an end of a survey of, the biblical, of biblical studies should, should end with the book of Revelation. But more than that, it's an end to the image or it's, it's a combination of uh, the taking us back to what God's uh, intention for the universe is in the first place. I said page 76, but go to 75, page 75, and you see the first sentence of this last chapter. In the midst of a vast universe, there exists a little speck called planet Earth. God loves the whole universe, and God loves planet Earth. You may not remember, but you, you heard that line before. Hold your finger there on page 75 and turn to page 1. That's what I did when I was reading that bit. Yep. And the very first sentence. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. In the midst of the vast universe right. of stars and galaxies, there exists a speck, a little speck called planet Earth. Revelation returns us, man and mercy returns us to the vision, the universe as God originally created, as God uh, originally intended. And for us to be partners with God in the mending of that universe so that it becomes again. Uh, what God uh, intends for the universe and indeed for, for all of us. We who are made in the image of God, that line, that idea that we are made in the image of God, in creation, back in Genesis, uh, invites us to see our partnership uh, with God. Now that we've discovered uh, how God is mending the universe and setting right the things that have gone wrong. Um, so some, some pieces about the book of Revelation. I found this uh, slide in, in some teaching materials and I thought it just might be helpful to you. Um, share. No, I can't find it. <laughs> gotta do that. You gotta do this. Share. Well, I'll read the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Ten quick facts about the book of Revelation. Ten quick facts about the book of Revelation. Number one, the book is not called Revelations. It's called Revelation. It's, it's a series of visions, yes, but it's all one revelation, the revelation of, of John. Number two, the author of Revelation is not John who wrote the fourth gospel. Probably oh. not. Probably not the, that same John that wrote the fourth gospel, but it has some of that imagery of it. Uh, nor do we think it was the disciple John, although that, that's, that's possible since we know so little about him. Number three, the text of Revelation was not actually written with us in mind, even though it's timeless. It was written, of course, for a particular audience in the first century who were suffering persecution. We talked a little bit about that uh, last week and a couple weeks ago. 
Number four. The focus in Revelation is not on the end time, but rather on Revelation in the present. Hmm. Very important. The focus on Revelation is not on the end time, but rather on faithfulness in the present. What are we up to? Number five? Five. Yes. Five. The, rank, the language of Revelation works like poetry. Each piece is separate, and yet they all intertwine. The language of, revolu of Revelation works like poetry. Each piece is separate, yet they all kind of intertwine. Um, one way to think of it is like a, um, cascading circles, or um, almost like a, a funnel cloud, and how the um, how the images work around and back upon one another. Next one. The revelation has two purposes. First, to call Christians to be faithful through their suffering and persecution. And second, to remind Christians that we cannot serve two lords. So there seem to be two purposes. First, to call Christians to be faithful through the persecutions and suffering, and second, to remind Christians that we cannot serve two lords. Next, all language in Revelation is non-literal. Mm. All language in Revelation is non-literal. Next one, the book of Revelation seems to have come about this way. God sent strange and awesome visions to a dreamer. His name was John, who was stuck on an island, probably imprisoned there on an island called, anybody remember the island? Atmos. Atmos, very good, yep, yep, yep. His dreams made no sense to the big deals of the world. <laughs> but to oppressed believers, they were a word of hope and trust. He wrote down the visions and the dreams made absolutely no sense to all the big deals of the world. But to oppressed believers, they were a word of hope and trust. Mm. How many do I got now? I'm not counting. Eight. 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 Number nine. Nearly two thirds of the language in Revelation clearly alludes to the Old Testament. Is that that last one? Nearly two thirds of the language, in the book of Revelation, clearly alludes to the Old Testament. Well, one of the difficulties, one of the reasons we have trouble with the, the book of Revelation and it's all of its imagery is because we don't know, we're not fluent right. in, in the in language of the Old Testament. Again, John's, John's audience uh, would have caught a lot of this stuff because th they would have known their scriptures so much better. And number 10, did I say about political and social dimensions? Not yet. No. That's the number 10. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> political and social dimensions abound in Revelation. So even though it's got all kinds of imagery from the Old Testament, uh, it's speaking to the politics and the social reality, the society of the first century. And that shouldn't be too surprising either, because the Old Testament does the same thing for its day. The prophets right. spoke to oh, the prophets. 
Right. Right. All the prophets spoke to the politics and the social dimensions of their time, back in the 5th century, the 6th century, B.C., the 7th century. So when Revelation picks up that language from Old Testament times, it's now applying it to the 1st century. And so we have, for a simple example, um, Babylon, which is the, the big bad uh, enemy of the Old Testament, is reused the word name babylon is reused in the book of revelation and it seems to indicate seems to uh, signify uh, the roman empire in the book of revelation all right so that for my money those 10 facts uh, help us a lot and two of them are especially important I said the one about the Old Testament, that nearly two-thirds of the language in Revelation clearly alludes to the Old Testament. That has helped me immensely because mm -hmm. it points me back uh, to reading the rest of the scriptures. And, and that one that said that the, revel the focus in Revelation is not on the end time, but rather on faithfulness in the present. What that does for me is it helps me point me forward to my time, to the 21st century, and say, how do I remain faithful uh, during the suffering, the struggles, uh, the perseverance that we must endure in our time? Again, the book of Revelation means to be a book of useful for a hopeful people, useful for people of faith. Ten fun facts. Good. Um, will you turn to in the Bible uh, the, the book of Revelation chapter four? Four. And what I'm interested in right now more than just the text of the bible at the, um, what the, the text in revelation chapter four we're going to look at chapter four chapter five does your bible have a heading there is there a a, a heading for this chapter chapter four no i don't know oh. Some, some do and some don't. I have Bibles that do and some that don't. But the heading isn't part of the Bible itself. This is an editor that has put it there. But but what is the heading that some, some have? Mine, the, mine says the heavenly worship. The heavenly worship. Good. Does anybody else have anything like mine that? Mine says the, the throne in heaven. The throne in heaven. Excellent. Good. And, and, and heavenly worship. This is a good example. Well, hold your finger in Revelation chapter 4, and then turn to the very back of the book. Revelation 19. Do you have any heading there? Back of the book. I do. Revelation rejoicing 19. in heaven. Rejoicing in heaven. Mine says hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good. Good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> what Revelation 19 is, is a vision of worship that happens in heaven. And it's kind of the culminating, it's almost the end of the book. We only get 21 chapters and 20, 20 or 22 chapters, 22. <laughs> is just kind of a, a closing, some closing words. But 19, 20, 21 are visions. Finally, the final set of visions are uh, John seeing worship that's happening uh, in heaven. And the reason to, to point to Revelation 4 is that's the first time that comes up in the book. Remember I said that the images, they kind of cascade, or they circle around again and, and return to some. So you can take parts of Revelation chapter four and have, where we've got 
some heavenly worship going on, a vision of what's happening in heaven, um, the throne of God and the lamb that's seated at the throne and um, the language there, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, um, the one seated on the throne, blessing and honor and glory and might and power. We looked at, we noted last week that these are um, lines that have made made their way into our own worship, into our liturgy. Oh, lit liturgy. Blessing and honor and glory and might and power and wisdom and strength be unto the Lamb. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? right? That's mm -hmm. in our world, that's it's all under uh, a song we, we call it, where the first line is, This is the feast. Right. This is the feast of victory for our God. All of this imagery comes right out of the book of Revelation in yeah, Revelation. That's a great song. And five. And then. It returns in Revelation 19, a little, a little bit. Um, the rejoicing in heaven. Yes, the rejoicing in heaven. All right, so I wanted you to see that in that, that without even reading the, the, the passage in Revelation 4. Let's look at Revelation 19 now. Just know that it that it continues what had already been shared, the the great songs um, all the way back in Revelation chapter four. Let's read Revelation nineteen. Somebody care to read? We're going to read one through. Oh, one through eight. I'll do it. Thank you. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged her on her the blood of his servants. Once more, he said, Hallelujah, the smoke goes up from her forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and to all who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of many thunderous appeals, thunder appeals crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him his glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her, it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, and for the fine linen, linen are the righteous deeds of saints. Okay, the, the, the bride the bride is the church, right? The bridegroom is Christ. Most often the, the image for, for Jesus in the book of Revelation is the lamb, you know. But occasionally in a couple of places, it, um, Jesus is the bridegroom. That is in, in order to introduce this image of the, of, of the church. Faithful people collectively are the bride. We are the bride of Christ. Christ has come to win us, to woo us, and to win us uh, into loving relationship uh, forever. What's the mood of this worship in heaven? What do you think is the, the mood of those who sing these songs? Praise. Praise, yep, yep. Or, oh, or happy. They, how are they feeling? What are they feeling? Hopeful. Happy. Happy, hopeful. Yep. Grateful. Great. Yep. Yep. Rejoicing. <laughs> rejoicing. Good. Excellent. Yep. Happy rejoicing. There isn't any any sadness. There isn't any, any anxiety, fear. Uh, for regret. Those. Regret. Well, it's almost like victory. The, the, yeah. the bad guys uh, lost. Yeah. We won. The bad guys lost. Yeah, yeah. Even when, when, they, when it notes yeah. the um, the victory over the um, and and the the putting down of uh, the great enemies here in, in this image that uh, that Jan read, it was the 
um, the, the great whore uh, who corrupted the earth with her fornication. God has, has uh, avenged on her the, with the blood of his servants. I mean, though, that's pretty harsh and difficult imagery. We'd love, this is why, why this song doesn't make it into our liturgy, right? <laughs> we're glad this song, we don't sing this every week. No, we, when we were looking for the, the, the song of heaven to sing. We'll go back to the, uh, the powerful and even the joyful language, the poetry of, of Revelation chapter four and five. Um, we could use some of this for hallelujah for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt, give him the glory. The mood uh, in heaven now is the battle is done. The victory is ours. Or the victory is Christ's. Uh, okay. That mood, that joyous celebration mood is what uh, manna and mercy is presenting us for us on page 76. Uh, so I wanted to share that background from the book of Revelation, but and it's why we have now this summary piece of uh, God's future god's god's present that god is holding out for us uh, with all of these uh bullet points on page 76 and then continues on the top of 77 so i'd like to go and and read these perhaps uh, one at a time does everybody raise your hand if you have manna and mercy in front of you and and would be okay all right, so I'm, I'm going to go across the uh, the screen of the people I see on my screen and invite you to, to read these kind of one at a time. I'll just start with the opening paragraph. In the midst of yearning for God's future, joy abound. That's the general mood. Right? That's a joy which no, long, which no power in heaven or earth can silence. This worship is unending, is what that vision has. Yeah. Joy reigns in the plants, the animals, the rivers, the oceans, the planets, the stars, and within humans who have eyes to see and ears to hear. All of creation is symbolized uh, uh, singing out this heavenly praise. Uh, together, they see the vision of God and they hear the word of God, which announces, uh, Judy, can you read that first one? Um, <clears throat> you are not alone. God is present. God fills the entire universe. God is Emmanuel with us always. Good. The spirit continues to create and to heal, gather, mend, enlighten, and unite. Okay. Um, let's see. Peter, can you continue? <clears throat> God continues to act. God has not abandoned planet Earth, but continues to live and act for the liberation of all humanity and all creation. The story of God goes on. Okay. Carol Lund. Lind. Lind, sorry. <laughs> Carol, can you read the next? Hello. God continues to act. God has not abandoned planet Earth, but continues to live and act for the liberation of all humanity and all creation. The story of God goes on. Thank you. Joan? Everything and everyone has dignity. All are created good, with gifts to share for the beautiful unity of the whole. Hope is certain. God declares in the resurrection of Jesus, Shalom will come. Great <laughs> down. The reign of God, the new creation, comes as extravagant, undeserved, unconditional gift. Okay. All are yeah. needed. Oh, oh, Joan, stop. We'll give somebody else a chance. Sure. Dan? Me? Please. <laughs> All are needed. God calls us, all of us, to serve as partners, to work, pray, dream, suffer, and even die for the sake of the new creation. Okay, and uh, let's see, I've got next Joyce. Can you read the last one? All are invited. Everyone, yes, everyone. Poor and rich, outsiders and insiders, women and men, young and old, those who are healthy and whole, and those who are sick, lost, empty, guilty, rejected, 
shattered, lonely, hopeless, <coughs> depressed, oppressed. All are invited to live in partnership with the Creator and to sing the hymn of the new creation, mended and made whole by the passion of God. Okay. So, and then, then we have the picture, which kind of tries to summarize all of this or, or wrap it all together. Um, all of these themes, which have been the themes for the whole book, um, are in a sense uh, pictured and, and come into the praise uh, of God, uh, the heavenly picture of what happens around the throne uh, of God. How everyone is invited, that everybody is needed, that there's dignity uh, across all of creation. It's a very hopeful vision. Um, which of these, let's see, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are eight of them there. Which of them is, is kind of grabbing you? Which of them is, is would you say is, um, I'm not alone. I think that grabs everything. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's grabbing you. It's grabbing you, right? You are not the very first one, right? You are not alone. Um, boy, don't, we, don't, don't we need that sometimes when, when we are feeling alone? Yeah. Grace abounds. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, okay. That's good. I like that one. I like uh, God continues to act. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. It's not abandoned. It's no, abandoned. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Which one is important for, you're speaking it for yourself right now. Which one you, would you say might be really important for the church to hear these days? Or us as all a, are invited. Are invited. <laughs> are invited. How well yes. do you think no. we all, all are needed. Are needed. All are needed. And all are needed. Good. Yeah. How, how how well do you think we sound that theme uh, in the church today? And what could what could we do that could we, that could be better? Where we could be better about about signaling that or sounding that. Well, I think with the with the pandemic that's going on, people are isolated and they don't know where to be. And the church is a place to be and, and reaching the people who were just home in the four walls by themselves. Yeah, yeah. You know, Good. You know and they need, need, they need to be brought in and the scripture has to be brought to them. Yeah, so maybe, uh, right. So um, more than we have in the past, uh, uh, we've got to discover those ways to share it out there. Now, uh, the technology is helping us do that. Yeah. Um, imagine if we didn't have have Zoom or we didn't have uh, even computers today. We'd be in trouble. Imagine how, how difficult this past year would have been. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Really isolated. Yeah, the, yeah. the isolation would have been really deafening. Yeah, really, di very difficult. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, that all are invited. Pretty significant now because there seem to be so many divisions that maybe the church is the one place that uh, we can just leave everything aside and uh, just come united, you know, in God. Very good. The, um, yeah. Um, the 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 picture of the diversity of the creatures uh, there at the throne worshiping God and, and uh, with the lamb at the center. Those are all sorts of people. Those are all mm -hmm. kinds of folks that, that are not, uh, not the usual folks that we might uh, be in, in social relationships with. Uh, everybody, everybody means everybody, including those so that I wouldn't necessarily have put on the guest list, right? Right, and I think that's where we as a church can model um, this 
invitation, this welcome. And I don't know, is it's by ignoring or trying to leave that aside? I don't think that's our role. I think our role is to step in to those muddied waters and to teach and invite and mm -hmm. um, talk about the issues and raise awareness mm -hmm. and get people to see each other. And sometimes that's only by discussion and looking at scripture and praying and um, realizing that we're more the same than we are different. And we can only do that by conversation and and by um, you know addressing addressing the needs of the other and addressing the hurt of the other. and. Right. recognizing that maybe we're part of that hurt and that we need to do something about that. So I think we have, a, you know, kind of a role as, as the church to, to lead the country, to lead our communities, to, to be a place that's relevant and that can be part of change and part of hope. Yeah, good, good. Read a, I read a very interesting article this morning. I might have sent that to you, Pastor Grant. Um, yeah, I saw from, yeah, from Isaiah. And uh, uh, it has to do with his vision of human security and virtue ethics and international politics. Okay, yeah. And, and Isaiah is talking a lot about, a, you know, Assyria and the, and the great... Uh, you know the, the enemy and everything like that, and yet it, he's saying that the vision of the vision of God uh, is not necessarily statehood. Uh, you know, each each state has its own little thing, but it's it's the whole idea of um, of what the covenant really meant, the Davidic covenant meant for all people, and in the carved at the United Nations is uh, Isaiah. A two, uh, chapter two, verse four, which I never knew this. Uh, he shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples and shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. She, neither shall they learn war anymore. Right. And this article just is so relevant talking about today you know, and talking about then, but but it's relevance for today. And yeah, I, what what you're saying is all are invited, and uh, that means everybody. And that's the whole purpose of what the United Nations is supposed to be. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yes, and, and so Isaiah uh, speaking to fellow Israelites, fellow Jews, is claiming, "Look, this God of the Jews is not just for the Jews." <clears throat> Uh, but God is uh, uh, seeking to invite all nations, and the Jews play a central role in that because they're the folks who are going to speak that word. They're going to tell about this God. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's really a power a powerful vision. Uh, Saint Paul, we're going to come back to Saint Paul in a minute, who who does the same thing in the in the Book of Ephesians. But if you're still in the Book of Revelation. Let's read a little bit on in, in Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21, uh, verses uh, 1 to 8. Uh, 1 to 1 to 1 to 7. Revelation 21, 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, 
for the old order of things has passed away. He who was sit seated up on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all, all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But yes, the cowardly, good. I'm yeah, sorry. That, that's probably, probably need to go through, through. I did hear you say seven, and I kept going. After a vision of worship in heaven, Revelation presents a vision on earth of something heavenly coming down to earth. The new creation happening uh, now, uh, something, what comes from heaven? What descends from heaven uh, to be on earth? God. Yeah. Yep, God does. Uh, how is God symbolized? Holy Spirit. Uh, does it say Holy Spirit here? No. Let's, let's use the text, right? The first heaven and the first earth. A bride, a bride. But there, there's a bride, yep. And the groom. The Christ is the groom, the Christ. church is the bride, yep. How about the first verses? Or the second verse? <clears throat> Holy Holy sin sin with no more. There's no more water. <laughs> New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is a city. It's but a it vision, says, of, it's it a vision says of, that, It says that God will dwell with these people. Yes, but how that's does why, God, That's right. why before I said uh, that uh, I, I'm not alone when I chose that, that uh, verse yeah, before. Yeah. Yes, because yes. God is always with us. He never leaves us. Good, good. Revelation 21 says the way we experience that or see that uh, the vision is of a new city, a new Jerusalem from heaven and being situated again on earth. Why is that important? Because what's, what's in Jerusalem? The temple. What is the temple? It's the dwelling place of God. It's the house of God. The way we talk about our church as a house of prayer or in the house where God dwells. Well, that's what the temple is, and so how how do we symbolize that God is going to be right there among us? Because it, because there's the temple, and the temple is in Jerusalem, and now we have the new Jerusalem, so that we don't leave. Revelation doesn't leave us with just a picture of angels and all creation there up in the clouds, up in heaven, worshiping God forever and ever around the throne. After a, a vision of heavenly worship, the, the motion is down to earth. This is so important so that we don't uh, end the scriptures, end our, uh, think of the culmination of our faith as simply just a heavenward uh, um, experience, but that faith and life in God starts and is right here on, on earth now uh, for us. Um, Manna and Mercy does this in a couple, couple of pages earlier. Back on page 73. And we noted it a, a couple of weeks ago, but I'm returning to this little picture down in the corner with the man holding the scroll on page 73. Mm -hmm. And what does he say? I saw heaven coming to earth, not souls going to heaven. Yes. You see why that's so important for us? Please notice the vision is heaven coming to earth, not souls going to heaven. I also think it's, um, I don't know if you were planning on mentioning this or not, but at the bottom of 93 in the notes. Yes, good. Yep. There's a graphic that is helpful here too. Yep. 
Um, it has go back to our pyramid. Yeah, good. Uh, which is a little different this time instead of slaves and stuff at the bottom it and of course now remember this is um when men had more power than women so ladies don't get too upset <laughs> well i mean this is this is the this classic is how it was patriarchal it's, vision right yes right. This is, this men are at the, the way, top this is the way the earth uh, <laughs> right work. next to god yeah right next yeah. to god yeah. exactly yeah. <laughs> Rich. that um yeah that this was the new pyramid that should be with men women children animals plants rocks dirt and earth but then look to the right and it has more how our manna and mercy ends with our circle yes of everybody good. or everybody needed everybody invited everybody equal around the outside and we're all connected and worship and we're all one with God in all of us. Um, I think yep. that's a nice visual to end our, you know, uh, and the little gophers or whatever they are. Yep. <laughs> so they, um, humans are always being um, called to leave some Pharaoh's Egypt and right. it's always hard. Yep. So the earth and its uh, sinful way will always recreate the pyramid and God will always call us to leave that pyramid structured life uh, to leave Pharaoh's Egypt and to join the vision of where everything is wrapped up in uh, the worship and praise of the one God creator and redeemer and sanctifier of all Um, which is hard <laughs> for us to leave our our it's notions. Understood. It's hard to, right. to understand that we're constantly pressed, we're constantly invited um, by the ways of the world to reconstruct uh, those pyramids. But God's vision is different from us. And the Christian view is that God's vision has come to pass in Jesus Christ, that Christ enables that, uh, that vision not only to be held out for us, but it enables us uh, to receive it, uh, to, uh, to actually embrace it. We can live this way. We really can live this way because, because of what Christ is, who Christ is, and what Christ has done. Okay, back on 77, uh, you have that, that picture there again. And then I want you to also turn to one more passage, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Three to ten. You have to go eight. You have to go eight. After one. Paul is putting forth. Um, he does this in Colossians. He does this in Ephesians. It happens in Romans. In several of his letters, Paul uses this kind of. Uh, sets forth this cosmic imagery, how all of the universe is bound up in what, what God is doing. Uh, but here in Ephesians, he tries to clarify for us how it all comes together in Christ, that it is Christ's uh, work. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 10. Uh, who hasn't read today? Who's interested in... Oh, wait. Thank you, Joseph. Blessed be, the, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Okay, it's the last phrase, to gather up all things in him. Oh, there you go, page 77. To gather up. Yeah. Gathering up of all things. That's what's pictured with yep. that strange word, ekephalisostasthai. On page 77. Hey, good job. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I was just wondering how you pronounce it. I've been practicing all week. And a cafe. And a cafe. Asta. It's the Greek word in Ephesians 1 in, in 9. Uh, and it's translated, Joe just read it as to gather up all things. Right. The gathering right. up of all things. So that's what that picture is. The, it's the. It's the heavenly vision of gathering up of all things but you see it's on earth right it's happening on earth with earthly images fish and water and trees and and mountains and animals and peoples bread and wine and mountains sky these are earthly things uh, all wrapped up together uh, in, in the picture of heaven. Uh, so that's our cover picture too. If you go back to your cover, yes, sure, sure. That, that's it there too. Yeah, there you go. Yep. We celebrate that uh, as um, that great gift uh, with that great word, uh, Alleluia, Alleluia. That's what happens in the book of Revelation. That's what the song is all about in the book of Revelation. And it's it's uh, why we still sing that as the great uh, Easter song. And it's why we put it away for Lent. Yeah. We're so eager for that to come back as, as if we, we need to hunger for it for a while. Put it, put it aside. We don't use alleluias during during all of Lent so that it, we, it might come first forth as a more joyful uh, song of celebration and victory in Christ at Easter. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Right. Yeah. So I thought the way to end this is for you just to, if you haven't yet colored, and but you've got some coloring, um, you've got some brands or pencils, um, we could listen to the Hallelujah Chorus and you could color in the last couple of minutes. So, okay. Okay. hallelujah, hallelujah. Handel put this uh, to music. The lines from Revelation chapter 19, uh, 6, but then some others uh, as well. See if it'll work. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> We're not up to next. Not up to next yet. Can you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. I could. Now I can. What happened? Now we can't. What happened? I can't hear it now. No. Why do I want to stand up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's supposed to remember this. Right?
it that many times. <laughs> yep, yep. The, that's that's the song of the heavens. What joy that we get to sing it here on earth. Uh, if we could live that way, that's the that's what that music um, stirs in me. The, the desire to live to live this out. And not let it be just a Christmas thing or just an Easter oh, thing. Yeah. Uh, but it it's for all time, for every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's risen indeed. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Next week we will uh, finish this study. I mean, we've got to the last page. There might be a, a some things in the notes we could look at. Uh, there is one more video that might be helpful for us to look at uh, next yeah, week. There's also a couple more videos we skipped along the way. We can go back and look at those. If we, if we, want okay. to. we have two more weeks and then it's Ash Wednesday, so we wouldn't have Bible study then anyway. And then we'll have the Lenten midweek as service as we had done during um, Advent. So we just have two more weeks to fill. So we'll, okay. Pastor Brant and I will look through the matter of mercy material. And if there's anything you guys want to suggest, some maybe some topic we went over too fast that you want to go back and take a look at some chapter, uh, we can do that too if you want. So send us messages if there's something that maybe you wanted to go into more deeply. We can make it kind of a catch up a couple of weeks. Sure. Okay. Hallelujah. 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 It's really uh, been a good a good study. I think it's a good it's study. a wonderful book. It's yeah, a it's been a great book. Yeah, great book. Enjoyed it. Great choice.